Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our study in Genesis. <clears throat> We're going to be under the uh, Creation to Babel, um, in the Creation to Babel book by Ken Ham, and we are on page 65. Um, so last time we read about the stars, and we read about the heavenly bodies. Does anybody remember <clears throat> what some of the purposes of those celestial bodies are? Like, why did God create the stars and things like that? Does anybody happen to remember? There's a bunch of reasons. Some are pretty simple. Some are a little more complicated. If you're talking sun and the moon and for light. Right. One's to guard the day. The other one's to, to guard the night, right? Anybody? Stars. Yeah, what would the stars be for? What was the example I gave you guys of the Underground Railroad? Does anybody remember that? <clears throat> Slaves used navigation. Navigation, yeah. <clears throat> they were they were basically meant for all sorts of things, like signs. When it says signs, it's not talking about future telling, as we said last week. But what it's talking about is signs of the changing of seasons. If you look at the Big Dipper, it rotates around the North Star. Slaves used the Big Dipper to be able to find the direction north. You have all sorts of things like that. <clears throat> Purposes for which the stars were created you know, include navigation, um, just marking out different time periods. We have different comets and things that cross into our horizon, our viewpoint, um, you know, every such and such years. You have different celestial bodies. Uh, you, the Bible actually mentions very specific ones, Orion and some other uh, belts of stars and things like that. You have galaxies, clusters, um, and, and all sorts of miraculous things. And so... Notice what it says in verse 15 of Genesis 1. It says, And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. So pause there before we read the last part. The purpose for the stars in these heavenly bodies and, and different things along those lines, it says, is to give light on the earth. Now obviously there's a variety of purposes, but notice what the last part of verse 15 says. It says, and it was so, and it was so. What that wording implies is that as soon as God created the sun, its light shone on the earth. <clears throat> and so the question is that we really brought up last week, it seems to be that God is saying, and it doesn't even seem to be, it's what the Hebrew implies, is that as soon as God created these things, the light was here. So there were no people at this time, but if you were standing on the earth and you were to just witness what God was doing, you would see a dark sky and then you would see all sorts of celestial bodies and you would see the light immediately. You would see them the moment they were created. But the real question is, how is that possible? Light only travels so fast. Light only... Um, Light only travels so fast. That was interesting. Uh, ringtone there. <coughs> um, I'll have to talk about that later off, off camera. Um, but um, yeah, so light only travels. How fast did I say light travels? Um, 86,000 feet per second. Miles per second. Does it say it right up there? Oh, no. <laughs> it does say it up there. I knew it. Oh, he, he knew it. He knew it. I know, I know he knew it. Uh, 186,000 miles per second. And so there have been different theories, we said, as far as, like, how did the light get here so fast? Because it's what Genesis said. But it could be that the most simple explanation is the best explanation. Yeah, if, if you believe God created the heavens and the earth, then it's not too far a stretch to believe <laughs> that the light was there when he created it. Yeah. He created the light and the stars at the same moment. Yeah, and, and so I, I mean, I think that that is a very likely possibility. I don't know if we need to go to any of the physics type stuff to figure this out, because God can raise the dead. God, you know, we know that the miracle of Jonah, we know that the laws of physics weren't fixed yet. And so it's possible, yes. Did he create Adam and put his word? Yes, so he did create the universe, the universe in a fully mature universe. Um, I usually don't say the appearance of age because then the question is like, 
what, what does that even mean? Like Adam, was he created with the appearance of age? No, he was created brand new. <clears throat> and what I mean by that is if you were to examine Adam, he wouldn't have any liver spots. Uh, would he have a belly button? Probably not, no. Uh, he would just be like a brand new, <clears throat> straight out of creation type uh, deal. But, but yeah, I, I will say a few of the explanations I don't like for how the light got here. <clears throat> Obviously the, the miraculous is a really good explanation because God was still doing things that are outside the laws of physics. He hadn't fixed the laws of physics yet, so it's very possible. Um, the other question is, <clears throat> how are we still seeing stars? How is light still getting here so quickly? So that, that's another question about it. You know, we can look at that. There is a young earth creationist theory that I don't like, <clears throat> and it says that God created the stars and then created light in transition. Like he created a, a really long light beam and he created the stars at the same time. I don't like this because according to Answers in Genesis scientist Jason Lyle, he's way smarter than me. Like he explains it, I won't be able to explain it near as good as him. But when you look at that in reality, it would mean that everything we're seeing in space is basically an illusion. God is creating fictions. Like what we're seeing doesn't isn't actually happening. So the question is, when you look out into space and you see a nebula, you see something explode, supernova. Are we actually witnessing that? Or are we seeing something way in the past? And I, and I would argue to you that we are seeing these things in real time. <clears throat> we are looking out into space. I don't believe you can look out in space and see back in the past. That's what a lot of modern scientists say. They say because light travels so slow compared to how big the universe is, when you look out in the deep space, you're actually looking back in time. And I disagree with that. because I don't think that's what the Bible teaches. Um, but there's a variety of ways of looking at this, and I'll, I'll explain my explanation here, my other one that I think really works, yes. I, I, I don't know, I would wholeheartedly disagree with you on that, but um, it's just like, you, then the same thing would happen with sound. We, we, we see something, we can stand it far away from something, and something occurs. Yeah, so sound travels at a certain sound. rate. It would that would imply that the universe would be billions of years old. So if you're looking at like if you're looking at like the Crab Nebula, which it, it would take billions of years for that light to to get here. But so, at the same time, you know, you had mentioned currently here where we are, light travels at 180,000 miles a second. Is there any theory that light can travel faster than that through uh, that beam? Or <clears throat> We're still learning about quantum physics so so you don't want to rule out completely that it's possible like I would say when we look out into the space I don't believe we're seeing billions of years ago but you could maybe try to say that the speed of light has changed I did list some arguments against that last week in that uh, I think it has some serious problems I they have not discovered anything in quantum mechanics that would imply that that's possible but the biggest thing is general relativity like our entire universe is governed by general relativity. So if you do change the speed of light, it has to be constant everywhere throughout the universe. If you change it, it changes the, effectively the dimensions of the entire universe. There are still young Earth creationists that do take that theory. It's called variable speed of light. I, I don't take that theory just because I think it's gonna change everything about the universe, like what we know about physics. Um, <clears throat> and I think it would change it a little bit too much. Um, could, it, could it be <clears throat> that the laws of physics Physics at, had not yet been established. Yeah, yeah, it could, it, that could be it. I, I think that the ASC model is the other option that's just really a good one. And that is that, and we said this last week, if I were to stand at up on stage and my dad was to stand back there and I were to take a laser pointer, we were to shoot a beam of light at the mirror and it was to come back to me. Like in theory, if you were able to measure that. And we timed it, obviously, this is a fake time, but let's say we timed the round trip as two seconds. Most people assume that light goes out one second, returns back another second, but we don't know that. We just take that on faith. It's impossible to measure the one-way speed of light. It, it's actually impossible based on relativity. You can't do it. So when we say 186,000 miles per second, really what that is is that's based on a round trip measurement. 
okay? We have no idea how far light travels out versus back. We can't measure a two-way speed of light. So it is very, very difficult to do that, um, to determine you know, what this is. And so there is a model that Answers in Genesis has promoted. And what it says is that basically um, it could be possible that the, the one-way the one speed of light, you know, the light speed out versus the light speed back is different. And so it's very possible that, you know, you could shoot that beam of light out and it takes um, essentially all two seconds to get air, but it comes back instantaneously. There's, there's no way you can roll that out based on physics. Does that make sense? So we just assume, based on what we know about science, that it's one second out, one second back, two seconds. It could be two seconds, infinite rate of speed back. And that's, that's allowable within general relativity. That's, there's nothing in that that contradicts general relativity. And so it is possible that God could be using some kind of convention like this to get light to Earth instantaneously. And that's allowable within general relativity. Now, there's critics of this, like there is any scientific model, but I don't want to get too complicated. Because this took me, honestly, <clears throat> I'm not like a, like a genius reading this stuff. I'm not like an astrophysicist. I read a 15-page paper five times to be able to really get this. And I still, it's very, very complicated. So it, does that make sense, though, that God could be using a different directional <clears throat> aspect for life? And I think that's very, very consistent with the text. Because read Genesis 1.15 again. <clears throat> it says very simply, in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and it was so that means this implies that as soon as God created them it immediately happened and I think that fits very well with what we know about the laws that he created to govern our universe and again it could be a miracle he could still be using miraculous means to allow us to see these things that are so far off and, and that's that perfectly fine I just think that for someone, you know, for, for old earth creationists to basically look and say, we can look clear out in the space and see clear back to the Big Bang, I think it's rubbish. I really do. I, I think that we as young earth creationists do have good answers for that. Um, and the other thing is, <clears throat> I will tell you this, I know we're kind of caught on one verse, but sometimes you got to take a while to break down one verse. When you look back into space, you do not see a past evolution of the universe. And I, I will tell you that right now. <clears throat> I've studied this. And if you look back in the past, there are certain things that you should see that we just simply don't see. We don't see um, these uh, reddish type stars um, that, that have a longer lifespan. We see, um, <clears throat> we also don't see other things, like for example, here's an example, in the early universe, if the Big Bang were correct, basically everything that we live on now, the Earth, is a result of these exploding stars. They're called population three stars. I don't want to get into the specific science of that, but if you look back far enough, let's say you're looking back in the past, you should see things a lot different than what we're seeing now. You should see a lot of long burning stars. Um, mostly long burning stars. We don't see those. We see quite a bit of short burning stars. You should also see primarily population three stars. I, I don't know to this day if they've actually found one confirmed population three star. Po the reason they call it that is because it's got lighter elements. They're comprised of three lighter elements. And you should see a ton of these because it was those stars that were there first. And then they created supernovas, they exploded, and they created everything we see now over billions of years. That's what the Big Bang says. So when you look out, if you're actually looking back towards the Big Bang, you should be seeing a much different universe than what you're seeing, and you don't see that. So um, <clears throat> now those are just a few examples. Like we could go down a list of things, like reasons why, like even other galaxies, they're too tight the way that they're spinning. Um, you, you, could, you could go down the list and say, like, if the universe was this old, these are the things that we should be seeing. But now, while this is complicated, I know we do get technical. Um, this stuff, I, I, honestly, like, it's available in Answers in Genesis, and they really do break it down. Very, very simple explanations, and it gives you an opportunity to defend your faith when you know stuff like this.
billions. Because someone could say, well, the universe is billions of years old. We know that because light's here. Well, there's, there's plausible explanations to the contrary. We also, you, know, you look back and, and you see the Big Bang. Do you though? And now you have answers to be able to say, hey, just, you don't have to refute them. Just get them to challenge their worldview. Say, is it really inconceivable that God did this? I mean, this is the reason why we believe God did this. And I think you've got some really good arguments for God's existence. I really do, from, especially from the cosmos, if you look at this. And I would say the other thing, <clears throat> let me read on through verse uh, 17 here. It says, Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. You notice God determined <clears throat> the purposes of these celestial objects. God determined their path, their orbit. Scientists today, one of the biggest questions that they have trouble answering is, why is the universe based on mathematics? Why is everything arranged according to these numbers? Like, for example, if you look at a snail's shell, it's very, very compact, very, very strong. It's built according to a number sequence called the Fibonacci code. And the Fibonacci code is called the golden ratio, snail shells. Different features throughout the earth are built on this mathematical sequence and ratio between numbers. So to say that that's accidental, like was physics around before the Big Bang? and the Big Bang relied on it, did the Big Bang create physics? Because then how could it be governed by physics? These are all questions that they can't answer. And, and why is it that everything is arranged according to these formulas? We can map out everything in creation based on these physical, these formulas, these things that define how nature works, how gravity works. Those things, I would argue, are evidence of a divine creator. It's, it's things that are genius because they come from a mind of genius. These types of things, these mathematical numbers and formulas, they don't come from natural processes. To say that these things originated just out of nothing from natural processes, I think is insane. Now, some people have said that they're eternal. <clears throat> That's also impossible too because these things are, they're contingent with the universe. And, and so it's like, <clears throat> there's just no explanation that non-believers have for where math comes from. Why does the universe have to listen to the laws of physics? You know, there's nothing that says it has to follow these things. And so it, it's just remarkable. <clears throat> I think that's, again, one of our best arguments as well. Um, and so, yeah, I, I do think it's incredible how he, he made the stars also. It just summarizes it in one little short line. Uh, and then look at verse 18, and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness and God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And so what we understand is at the end of this day, the fourth day, God saw that it was good. It was complete. And so to me, again, that means that the function of what these stars and things were was perfect when God created them. Now, would there have still been supernova explosions and all kinds of other things? I don't know that because honestly, it doesn't seem to be that really, if you look at creation, until Adam sinned, I don't think anything was winding down. God's creation was perfect. There was no decay. And so Romans 8 says that God's, you know, you look at God's creation grows, grows. Uh, for the redemption and so I don't uh, I don't see any of these things happening there's no animal death there's no stars exploding things like that until the sin of Adam which cursed creation um, and so we're going to move on now there are some interesting passages uh, it says uh, on page 69 is anyone out there talking about aliens. Are there <laughs> life forms out there like us? Um, the only thing that would be out there would be the angelic beings. Amen. Okay, Angelic beings are, do live among the stars. That's what we're taught in the scriptures. They're called the stars in some cases. Um, <clears throat> I think based on the Bible, we know that man is the pinnacle of God's creation. Man is the only advanced intelligent life form created in God's image. Amen. To, so to say that there's other races of humans 
Jesus didn't die on the cross for their sins. He died on the cross for the descendants of Adam. I think you can make a very good argument that aliens don't exist other than if we want to talk extraterrestrials. We'll get to Genesis chapter 6. Who were the sons of God, the daughters of men, all that kind of stuff. But that's those are angelic beings. Okay, we're talking demons, angels. Um, are you know if you watch a show, Ancient Aliens, um, they're, they're they're always talking about these ancient societies. They have like the Jaguar God and all these things. They they came down and taught them wisdom. That's all. None of that's real. At most, I would say that these societies have been inspired by demonic activity, and and there has been Satan's presence throughout human history that has deceived people. I would say that's a thing, but as far as these highly intelligent aliens that seeded human life and came back to teach us things, that, that doesn't exist. You know, Ancient Aliens is still fun to watch, to kind of poke fun at, to be completely honest. Uh, just don't, don't be deceived by it. it it's, it's, it's hilarious to me, because it's always the same thing every single episode. Spoiler alert, it was aliens, yes. Yeah, one of the followable, it's very followable arguments that people try to make though, it has nothing to do with with, with the te context there, or text as it states it. But some people will, will try to validate the idea of there being extraterrestrial beings in terms of, let's say, other life forms in the, in the universe based on the size of the universe. And they say based on just the enormity of the, uni of the known universe and beyond that there must certainly be other life. But, and I know, you, I think you addressed this weeks ago, maybe you did. But I don't know if it's, you know, do you have a comment on that as far as just the, the, the enormous expanse? Because there are ramifications for eternity in that. I don't know if you want to um, explain. Yeah, that might, be that, a, that might be a thing that's a little bit later on. Okay. Talking about the multitude of the stars, the angelic realm. <clears throat> I, I do believe, I'm one of those theologians, if you will, that does believe that the, spa the space that we see um, <clears throat> is, I know, it's gasp for air. Uh, is so big because of two reasons. Number one, it reflects God's glory, which is the main purpose. And the other two, I do believe that it's the housing place of the angelic beings. Because angelic beings are here as ministering spirits, as Hebrews 1.14 says. And so I do believe from the scriptures, we can say that there are likely trillions and trillions of angels. And so <clears throat> I do believe that, uh, that there is an aspect to that there that's kind of a different study. But... Um, I want to give you one other thing to consider before we move on to chapter 5. Uh, Matthew 2, 1 and 2. We're not necessarily going to turn there, but if you want to read the account of the wise men visiting uh, Jesus, that was probably, you could say, the biggest sign that was ever given. And that's a good example of what does it mean that the stars were given as signs. That's a great example. Now, was it a real star? Was it a combination of stars crossing over? I have no idea. That's not something we really want to split hairs over. I've heard interesting theories as far as both. If you watch the Nativity story, they take the theory that the different stars aligned and you know, planets and stuff, and they cast light on the Earth. Um, some people say it was a miracle, just a miraculous star that existed at that time period and doesn't really exist anymore. I, I would maybe tend towards that. I don't know them. I have no idea. But I do know that God did use a star to show where Christ was. And that was the biggest sign of all because he's obviously the savior of the world. And so that's the most important thing. Um, and a good example of what we mean by, by, by signs. Not like future telling or astrology, you know, Libra versus your, your astronomical signs. Obviously, we know that's not biblical. Um, can somebody read verse... Uh, we're going to get on to day five here. Um, can someone read verse uh, 20 through 23? Verse 20 through 23. Yeah, I will. Okay. okay. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly and the moving creatures that have life and fowl that they may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every given creature that moveth which the waters brought forth abundantly after their own kind and every winged fowl after his kind. And God said that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the sea and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. 
So the fifth day is really interesting. You see a lot of stuff going on here. Um, and we do believe, as Answers in Genesis believe, that uh, South Private uh, dinosaurs and humans coexisted. Amen. Uh, so just take a deep breath for a second on that one, because if you're watching online, uh, that's a hard one for people to stomach sometimes. Um, but I do believe, if you believe a literal interpretation of Genesis, this is this is an interpretation that we are we are forced to take. I won't say forced because <clears throat> I do think there's actually good arguments for this, and I think I think we can prove it. But uh, and they have a lot of really interesting pictures of, of creatures and stuff described by early societies, Mesopotamian societies, stuff, <clears throat> like dragons, as they would as we would refer to them as maybe in popular culture. What these things look like. Um, and we didn't have cameras back then, so we don't know. Like, what was the behemoth that Job mentions? What was the Leviathan? What are these creatures that breathe fire? Like, we don't ultimately know for certain, um, but, uh, but we do believe that humans and dinosaurs coexisted. Now, sea creatures were created, and what's interesting here, as you know, is birds are created as well. We've already said we don't believe in a gap, so you can't like put dinosaurs, they've died off already, and plus Adam hasn't sinned yet, so that would imply that there's like hundreds of millions of years of death before Adam sinned. So we kind of have to rule that out. We also find dinosaurs, uh, in fact, T-Rex, uh, a T-Rex was discovered, there's cancer in dinosaur bones. Cancer has been found. And so you'd have to admit that things like cancer existed before the fall, and that God looked at creation and said, this is very good. But we wouldn't say that that's very good. Our creator, God, didn't create those things. Those things were brought into this world by sin. And, and now we live with the repercussions of Adam's sin, the first man, the first, the first person to fall. That's why this stuff is here. But uh, one other interesting contradiction between this and evolution is that we see birds are being created at the same time as these giant sea creatures. You could lump in sea creatures, dinosaurs. What's, what's interesting is that some scientists say that essentially dinosaurs evolved into birds but we see here birds are created before the land creatures land creatures would include dinosaurs and all sorts of things like that so we see here that the biblical model contradicts some scientific models now i will say not all evolutionists believe that birds evolved into dinosaurs there are still some scientists that do believe that i think that theory is becoming less popular though I don't know if it's because of Jurassic Park uh, or, or what, uh, but um, that theory is becoming a little less credible. I, 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 I think it's, yeah, we're not going to get into that theory. I'm not even sure if it's worth really trying to refute or anything like that. Uh, you can read up on it. Answers in Genesis, they have tons of good articles on that one. But, yeah, so we see the birds and we see the enormous uh, sea creatures. So that would include whales. It would include... Um, what we would call like prehistoric type dinosaur type swimming creatures. Um, I don't even know. I honestly, I've seen pictures of the dinosaur on the left. It's an amazing picture on page uh, 72, but I don't know what its name is. It's cool. Uh, it looks like the Loch Ness monster. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna call it Nessie. Uh, plesiosaur. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I've, I've, it's funny because I've actually heard of plesiosaurs, and I've seen that. But the connection wasn't in my head until just now. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Hey, one other thing just to uh, springboard off what you're talking about. Yeah. This fantastic idea of dinosaurs and human beings cohabitating. Uh, that also has further ramifications when we talk about the ark. But, um, and that's down the road. But when you consider the fact that in, in, I think it was 1854, the first reconstructed dinosaur, prior to that 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 mid uh, 19th century, yeah. the word dinosaur didn't exist. It was coined after that. Yeah. And when they fully reconstructed bone structure of what we now know as a dinosaur, that from that moment forward, they began to have these exhibits of bones that they found. But the reason that's significant is that establishes the fact that, that prior to the mid 19th century, we really didn't, as you said, didn't have any pictures. The only things we have are pictographs and other things where there are fully reconstructed or carved in stone, things like stegosauruses and so forth, that were done over a thousand years ago that, 
that have never been reconstructed. The only way they could do that would be if they actually saw it. And I think it's actually it's very stunning. I think it's actually pretty hilarious that the movie Jurassic Park. <coughs> I, I've heard scientists actually analyze this. They actually, according to evolution, because they do support evolutionary biology and stuff in that movie, they actually picked the wrong name for the movie. Because according to evolution, the dinosaurs that you're seeing in the movie would not actually be around at the Jurassic period. They would actually be around, I think, at the Triassic period. So, yeah, so the dinosaurs are actually all incorrect according to Jurassic Park. They should have renamed it um, Triassic Park or one of the other ones. Um, uh, the What's the other one? I can't remember the other name of the other period of time. I learned all this in geology in college. I actually had a really cool chart I was going to bring in for you guys, and I forgot it at home uh, about some of this stuff. So, yeah, so, so the big question is, are dinosaurs birds? Are birds dinosaurs? No. Um, there have been fossil transitions that have supposedly been found. All of them have been proven to be hoaxes. They've never found any evidence of dinosaurs evolving into birds. Now, there is common, there may be commonalities in bone structure. It's like there's similarities between some of the bone structures of humans and apes. And, and my thing is, there's similarities between Microsoft PowerPoint and Microsoft Word. That doesn't mean that they evolved from an explosion uh, 65 million years ago. It means that the same guy created both and he put the same markers into both things, right? Microsoft PowerPoint, Microsoft Word, and they have the same code built into that. Just because, you know, apes and humans, we both have hands and stuff, that is not evidence that we evolved from apes. <laughs> and so, and same with birds, their hip bones, other things. They may be similar to a Velociraptor. The way they move around might be similar on two legs like a Velociraptor, but that doesn't mean the Velociraptor evolved into a, a dove or another type of bird that we see today. And so um, don't listen to the, the, the documentaries that tell you this stuff is a case closed thing. All right, we got to end. Unfortunately, we, I'm hearing the bell ring. Guys who joined us online, uh, I'll close us in prayer, and then uh, uh, you probably heard that. Uh, God bless you all, and we'll see you in tomorrow's video. <coughs>